Wong Kar Wai has long been one of my favorite directors. His filmmaking is a high energy, super visual expression that channels the spirit of characters, places, and emotions in an experimental form. With a vividly saturated palette, a balance between chaos and beauty, and a heavy focus on characters deeply concerned with personal emotional relationships, Wong's style has become synonymous with Hong Kong cinema's second new wave. As I do in this series, I'll take a look at three different films made by Wong Kar Wai at three increasing budget levels. The low budget as Tears Go By, the medium budget in The Mood for Love, and the high budget, The Grand Master, to identify how his filmmaking progressed throughout his career. Before we get started, I'd like to give a special thanks to all the patrons and everyone who supported the channel by getting in-depth cine merch. This wouldn't be possible without you guys. Now, back to the video. Wong grew up in Hong Kong and after graduating got his first taste for film production work through interning at a TV network. He quickly began a career as a screenwriter, starting out in TV series and soap operas, before moving up to writing film scripts. Not all of this work was very creatively fulfilling. Wong claims to have written over 50 screenplays during this time, most of which he was uncredited for. By the late 1980s, he'd found a mentor and director Patrick Tam and wrote the screenplay for his film, Final Victory. It was intended to be the second installment in a trilogy of films that tracked some characters in the underground world's progression from teenagers to their 20s and their 30s. Wong imagined the first installment in the gangster film trilogy being As Tears Go By. For some quick context, in Hong Kong in the 1970s and 80s, a group of filmmakers emerged to form a new movement called Hong Kong New Wave. Although it was more an accidental outcome than an intended movement on the part of the directors, many of them were drawn to making genre films which included fresh experimental elements that broke away from tradition and tread the line between art, political commentary and mass entertainment. By 1987, the film industry in Hong Kong was prospering under this movement and seeking new films from new directors to continue this run of success. Using his industry connections from his time as a screenwriter, Wong became a partner in In Gear, a newly formed independent production company with producer Alan Tang. He was granted considerable creative freedom to direct a film in the gangster genre, which tended to perform well financially at the time. For his directorial debut, he returned to the idea of As Tears Go By. Despite doing lots of research, I wasn't able to track down the exact budget that was greenlit, but interviews established that the budget was low by the standards of the time. Our intention is to make a gangster film without hero. They are, they are failure, they are not success. So they are not the big boss or the, the hero in the mafia world. It is just like a normal failure and, and how they deal with that problem. So I think already the film is not a genre film, even though it, it's, it's named as a gangster film. When it comes to writing, Wong takes an approach which breaks away from the norm. While many screenwriters start the writing process by developing a story and then slotting various characters into that story, Wong conceptualizes characters as a starting point, and then develops the story based on what he imagines the characters would do. To him, stories are far less important than characters. He also notes that as the characters come from him, the personalities of the characters cannot be separated from his own preferences. Perhaps this is why there are many commonalities between many of the characters in his films. His stories are also very influenced by locations, something we'll return to later. In the case of As Tears Go By, it's set in an area of Kowloon in Hong Kong near to where he grew up. When it came to directing the film, he initially aimed to take inspiration from his directing mentor, Patrick Tam. Patrick is a very organized director. He has all this uh, storyboard and uh, the sh uh, shot list way before shooting. And he's very precise on all these shots. And I thought I'm going to be like, like Patrick or, or Hitchcock. Everything is already a uh, decide. But then I realized the night before the shooting, I'm still working on the script, you know. I tried to fix it and I said, well, I will wake up in the morning and to have a shot list at least so everybody won't be panicked. 
and the call time is like 9 and I wake up at 8. From this first ever day of shooting, this became his de facto working style. Arrive on set without much of a plan, and build the film from there using the elements that presented themselves. Wong and his cinematographer on the project, Andrew Lau, introduced many experimental visual elements into the film, which Wong would continue to use throughout his later career. As Tears Go By was photographed using interesting, unconventional low angles, colored neon lighting, a reactive handheld camera, and perhaps most notably, step printing. This technique, which became synonymous with Wong, is achieved by shooting at 12 frames per second, and then printing every frame twice. When the footage plays back at the standard 24 frames per second, it therefore includes two printed frames of each single frame, instead of one. The result is a rough, experimental, jarring emotional effect, where the audience is suspended in moments for longer, and where time is distorted. Lau photographed the film in the 1.85 to 1 aspect ratio. Wong would choose to photograph most of his later films in either this, or the even squarer 1.66 to 1, usually staying away from widescreen. As Tears Go By established connections with cast and crew members that Wong would work with throughout the years, such as actress Maggie Cheng and William Chang, who worked both as an editor and as an overall art director in all of Wong's films, doing the costumes, production design, and providing an overall eye for the film's aesthetic. For a first film, As Tears Go By carries remarkably similar trademarks to many of Wong's later films, such as casting pop culture stars, experimental photography, musical motifs, and a character-focused, high-energy story. It was produced on a low budget by only hiring a small core crew, containing the scope of the story, limiting the length of the production timeline, and shooting mainly on location without big set builds in lower budget locations in Hong Kong. As Tears Go By performed remarkably well at the Hong Kong box office and kickstarted Wong's career, after a string of commercially and critically successful films set in contemporary time, Wong embarked on making a period drama set in the 60s, which would be a sort of spiritual and thematic successor to his earlier film, Days of Being Wild. In his unconventional style of working, Wong started doing little segments of unauthorized shooting without a script and began writing a rough treatment for the film, a loose guideline which he used to secure funding, which acted as a skeleton for the structure of the movie. To sketch out the film, he assembled a team of his frequent collaborators, actors, art director William Chang, and the cinematographer who had shot his previous five films, Christopher Doyle. I feel very excited uh, to, to work with a bunch of people around me and sharing the same spirit. It's not only like your idea, you have to make, to visualize the idea, and you need all the collaborations with not only the cast, but also the crew. And because I'm writing all the time, the film is not always in an organic form. It's not like fixed. I can't write without knowing the space. I, I need to know uh, where the story will happen and how the story is going to happen between who. I can create a story because I find a very interesting space, but I cannot imagine something like very abstractly on a paper. To find the right location for the film, they initially scouted in Beijing, but difficulties in securing permits and shooting permissions at short notice prevented this, and Hong Kong was chosen as the backdrop for the story instead. However, since many of Hong Kong's locations had modernized since the 1960s, Wong and Doyle went in search of exterior locations which felt more correct to the period. In Doyle, Wong found a collaborator for whom the space the film takes place in was an integral part of the story. Together, they would carefully scout and select locations which informed the themes and language of the movie. Decided to shoot part of In the Mood for Love in the heart of Bangkok. So what do you say? For me, there's something about this wall and, and the sense of loneliness. There's something about the way in which, you know, it, 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 is, it is falling apart. Uh, there's something about the way when I first came here, the light fell on these walls that gave it a texture. There is a sense of loss there. 
Unlike other Wong Kar Wai films which were shot with very wide angle lenses, sometimes even as wide as 6.5mm up close, personal and chaotic, In the Mood for Love took an approach to cinematography which was more detached and formal, to emphasize a feeling of loneliness that the characters were experiencing due to their failing relationships. Doyle shot the film with medium to longer focal lengths, often a 35 and 50 mil from the looks of it, from further away, and used foreground in the majority of shots to further distance us from the characters, and create a feeling of alienation, claustrophobia, and separation. I just felt that giving one more layer of, one more level of detachment, one more level of remove made it even more lonely. So we shot most of that sequence through here as a tracking shot. It happened because this space, with this light, with this particular possibility, gave us this moment. Doyle photographed it on an Ariflex BL4, mainly using a dolly or sticks for slow moves or stationary frames. He likes operating himself with a fluid head such as an O'Connor 2575. He lends the film with Zeiss glass, super speeds by the look of it. The film was captured on higher speed Kodak stocks. 500 tungsten and 800 tungsten. This created an image with plenty of grain and texture, while requiring less powerful lights to be used for the numerous darker night and interior scenes. He lit the movie mainly with lots of undiffused hard light. This creates highlights in the skin and defined lines of shadow. While he kept things relatively neutral color-wise and seems to have mainly used tungsten lights for the tungsten balance film stock, There were still moments where he gelled lights to create strong color casts. The costumes and overall palette from William Chang were saturated, punchy, textured and appropriate to the 60s. Due to Wong's method of finding the story while he shot without a script, his shooting ratio, the amount of total footage he shot in relation to what made the final cut, was very high. He reportedly sometimes shot as many as 40 takes which he used to find his vision from by manipulating the camera, different performances, dialogue or thematic ideas from the actors. The style of changing the story as he went by introducing new scenes and ideas on the fly meant that In the Mood for Love went over schedule and over budget. So much so that Doyle had to leave the project near the end due to another scheduling commitment. He was replaced by Taiwanese DP Mark Lee Pingbing who maintained the same visual language to complete the film. Production finally wrapped after 15 months of shooting. In the Mood for Love was therefore shot on a medium budget by maintaining a fairly small scope story with few cast and crew members and no large set pieces, however its extremely lengthy production schedule drove up the costs. The director's reputation for shooting over long production periods was pushed to the extreme on the Grand Master. The initial idea that Wong put forward was to produce a documentary on martial arts. To prepare, he went to various regions of China for a year doing research. In 2009, he brought cinematographer Philippe Le Seud onto the project without a script to shoot material for a documentary or biopic about martial arts which was set in the 1930s, 40s and 50s. It developed into a martial arts drama based on the life of Ip Man, which is eventually shot over a period of three years. Every, every time and every day was a discovery with him about what could be the scene. Of course he was writing every night, but you didn't know if the scene we could shoot for two days, one week, ten days or two months. His way of working opened up many possibilities which may have been impossible to see when committing words to the page or storyboarding a scene ahead of time. The locations may influence new angles, color palettes or story ideas on the day. However, the challenge of working like this for the cinematographer is to maintain a coherent look and continuity in lighting when the same scene may be shot years apart. It's a big challenge for me uh is to keep, to keep consistent uh, the light. I have to keep a diary about uh, each shot I was shooting. One set we shot the, in 2009, I came back uh, three years later, so I was making notes uh, on every shot about 
where I put the light, which color I use, which light I use, because I didn't know, you know, if we finish the scene or not. At times he would show a photograph as a reference and at other times he would play music on set during a take for the camera and actors to get a sense of the correct pacing, movement and rhythm that he wanted. He'd then turn off the music and repeat the take. Le Sud elected to shoot on 35mm for the textural component that it provided, which he felt better represented the look of the period drama. They used Aricam Studio and light cameras with Cook S4 Primes for their ability to reproduce slightly softened, pleasing skin tones. For the first time, the director elected to shoot this epic in a 2.35 to 1 widescreen aspect ratio. They went into the project shooting on Fujifilm, Eterna 250D and 500T stocks. However, since the shoot lasted over three years, a problem arose. Fujifilm stock was discontinued by the company. The production was tasked with sourcing what was left of the 35mm stock from around the world. In 2012, to complete the film, they finished shooting the last ever can of Fujifilm Eterna motion picture film. A few select slow motion sequences during fight scenes were captured in 2K with a phantom flex at 1000 frames per second. The colorist then matched this with the Fujifilm footage during the DI. As always, in post-production the director was forced to cut much of the footage they had shot and find the film in the edit by distilling the story into its most important elements. The Grandmaster's excessive production timeline, as well as its more difficult to photograph set pieces, fight scenes, larger crew and extensive production design meant it was Wong's highest budget film at around $39 million. Wong Kar Wai directs like a writer, changing locations, themes and character motivations as he goes. For a writer, all it takes is an eraser or a simple press of a backspace key. When making a film, it's a bit more tricky. There's a reason that the film production pipeline works the way that it does, with a carefully planned script, schedule and budget. It's the same reason that most of Wong's films went over budget and took large amounts of time to shoot while he found a story during the process of making it. What his unusual method does provide is a massive amount of freedom to explore creative ideas and find possibilities which may not have been initially imagined by the writer. His method may be unusual, but it has produced some of the most interesting and best made films of all time. Thanks for making it through this episode and a special thanks to all the supporters of the channel on Patreon. Let me know what other directors you'd like to see featured in this series. Otherwise, until next time, thanks for watching and goodbye.